It also provides for us some solid direction for 2021, whether it's those of us who are pastors or to use that to, to keep the P word going, pastors or parishioners, no matter who as, as believers. And it speaks to Pastor Andrew and to me. It speaks to you. And I beg all of you this morning to give listening ears, to have a pliable heart and a readiness to change and obey. Now, this was a serious hour that Paul uh, wanted Timothy to sense the importance of it. It was important not only because Paul was facing death, uh, but change was coming in leadership in the church there at Ephesus, and, and uh, even more because both Paul and Timothy would be judged one day when Jesus Christ appeared. And here's what I want us to see this morning. Here's my sentence sermon. Out of this passage, in view of the Bema, we must preach and practice the word. In view of the Bema, we must preach and practice the word. We have seen this outline in the Second Timothy. We have seen encouragements from a disciple in these last days, from chapter one. Endurance in discipleship in these last days, chapter two. And extreme discipleship in these last days coming out of chapter three. Now today, chapter four, exhortations for discipleship in these last days. There are some strong exhortations here for us as pastors, and as I said a while ago, as parishioners. And I want you to note two of them. They're in the sentence sermon. The first one is preach the word. Now, no matter what occurs in 2021, preachers have a clear command. It is preach the word. Local churches no matter whether we are able to gather or we're virtual or whatever may occur, this command is to the church, preach the word. When we gather in Sunday school, small groups, whether we gather in a fellowship at a prayer breakfast or whatever, the command is preach the word. To Pastor Andrew, and to myself, the command is preach the word. And I want you to see in the outline, first of all, number one, preacher, preach the word. You note, as was read and you've read this week in verse one and two, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Letter A, I'm going to use a, an inductive means here of how we study scripture. We ask these questions, who, what, when, where, why, how? And so letter A, why do we preach the word? Well, it's very clearly given to us in verse one. Even at this very moment, as I'm here in my uh, living room and you're seeing my face and the, the PowerPoint on the screen, you're seeing my face. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you're seeing the PowerPoint. But I'm reminded, why do we preach the word? Because one day, I'm going to be looking into the face of Jesus Christ. And he will reward, or it will be wood, hay, and stubble. The many times, sadly, that I've preached, and I preached what I wanted to preach, or I, I preached in the flesh, and I really didn't preach the word. But I'm preaching in the presence of God right now. And I will be judged accordingly later in the presence of the word 
the Logos, the Lord Jesus Christ. So why do we preach the word? Why are we going verse by verse? Because I want Pastor Andrew, myself, Hunter, whoever else has been called to preach through the ministry of Boone's Creek Bible Church, to be able to say we preached the word because we'll give an account before the Lord. Sunday school teachers, I'm going to turn this from preachers to, to teachers, Sunday school teachers, you will stand one day in the presence of God and you will give an account and he will judge righteously. Did we preach, teach the word? Why do we? Because it is Christ, the living word, and we're going to give an account as he says, I charge you therefore before in the presence of the of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is deity. This is why we preach the word. It's not before men. This passage doesn't read, I charge you therefore before men. Now the fear of man brings a snare. He says, you preach the word because you are preaching for the glory of God and presenting the deity of Jesus Christ. That's why we preach the word. But then notice letter B, what do we preach? There in verse two, there's this phrase, preach the word. The word preach here means to herald. You see, the herald was the king's messenger and he would relay the king's message to the people. Now, I want you to know something, and I want you to get this. The herald was not free to make up his own message. He wasn't a politician. He wasn't allowed to put his own spin on what he thought should be said. His job was to proclaim faithfully, precisely, what the king said, what the king's message was, so the people could understand it. I read to Pastor Andrew the other night, and, and uh, uh, Paul, uh, my son-in-law, we were sitting just talking about preaching, and I read this statement that said, the preacher's message should come out of the text and be governed by the text. Preach the word. Now, now, congregation, I want you to get something here. Notice he didn't say just the word preach. There's a lot of preaching that goes on. But he commands Timothy to preach the word. And Paul even said in Acts 20, 27, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The command here is not to just preach. The command is to preach the word. So we see the why. We see the what do we preach. But then notice when do we preach? Well, verse two, in season and out of season. What it means is, is that we preach the word, whether it's convenient or inconvenient whether it's welcome or it's unwelcome, whether it's favorable or unfavorable, whether it's affirmed and loved or criticized and hated. I want to announce to you that since the word is always profitable, it's always appropriate, it's always sufficient, coming right out of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, then preach the word anytime and all the time, anywhere, and everywhere. There is no time when preaching of the word is not appropriate. It's not what we want to say, but it is what the word, the Logos, Christ is saying to us. So when do we preach? Anytime, every time. And what do we preach? The word. And why? Because it's before God. It's how he has designed for the word to go forth. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, as Isaiah says. 
But letter D, notice, how do we preach? It's in verse 2. We preach the word with life application. Notice these phrases. He says, preach the word, be ready. In other words, you are to, at any moment, be able to share the word, to preach at any moment. And he says, in doing so, you convince. The word here means to reprove, to bring to light. In other words, we appeal to the reason. And when I'm preaching I, and, and seeking to convince you, I, I'm, I'm playing to your thinking, your reasoning, and, and bringing to light sin or areas, even the question a while ago, when I ask, what have you learned about God in 2021? What I was doing was trying to bring to light some things to help you apply in your life. Okay, this is how God is, and this is how I should be. This is what truth says, and this is how I should walk. I'm constantly, as preachers, we're turning on the light to see where we need to change, where we need to grow, what we're doing right, how to stay right. That's what the scriptures do, 2 Timothy 3, 16. But he also says to rebuke. How do we preach? We speak seriously, solemnly. We're appealing to your conscience. It's with gravity. There's a, there, the, this is the word. And like it makes no difference what anybody else says. What does the word say? There is no higher authority than the word of God. It transcends every man's thinking, all of man's words. You read Psalm 119. Spend some time studying Psalm 119, and you will see how important God's word is. You have, even as the, the psalmist said in Psalm 119, you want to be more wise than your teachers? The ancients know the word. Then notice the word exhort. As preachers, we, we not only convince, we rebuke, but we exhort, we appeal to the will and emotions. Many times you see me, and I mean this, I'm begging you, and I will say that as a pastor, one of the things that, uh, that, that burdens my heart many times is I wish I could change you, but I can't. But I know the power of the word can. And if you'll just listen to it, as it's given, and we appeal to your reason, to your conscience, to your, your, your will and emotion, to your heart. He says, preach with great patience. I know, and I forget, but I know it takes time for people to change. We don't always get it the first time. I don't always get it the first time. And sometimes I found myself reading a passage and I go, oh, why didn't I see that before? It's because I wasn't ready to receive it. I wasn't listening. And sometimes you get weary of maybe hearing us repeat things over and over and over again. But we are to be patient with you just as you are to be patient with us. I will say this without reservation. My heart's passion is to give careful instruction so that you, church, can grow in Christ. I have no greater desire than to hear that my children walk in truth. And we think of that in the family context, and we should. But I will say this, as a pastor, and I can speak, I'm sure, for Pastor Andrew and anyone else who preaches in the pulpit or in this means, my passion and heart for you is that we would grow in Christ. And that we do so through great patience and also teaching, instruction. You see, true preaching is not only the explanation of the passage, but it's the application as well. And it's the Holy Spirit that drives it home. And if there is just teaching without application, then it can just be religious talk. And as you know, there's a lot of preachers that can say a lot of things with a lot of amens, amen, and, and, and you know, and amen, and amen, and, and, and amen, uh, and on and on and on it goes. And, all, and there's nothing wrong with stories, nothing wrong with 
things to get us to understand an object lesson or whatever. But I'm going to tell you, we're to preach the word with life application. But then notice in verse three and four, number two, we are, as we look at the Bema, we're not only to preach the word as the preacher preaches the word, but number two, people listen to the word. Somebody say it this way, preacher, preach the word. People listen to the word. Look in verse three and four, because people, you help the preacher when you listen to the word. And I want you to note something here in verse three, when he says, for the time will come, and that time is here. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We want a lot of entertainment. We want a lot of music. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with laughter. Nothing wrong with those things. But Notice he says, the time will come and has come when they will not put up with, they will not stand sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. And notice the word according. It means the word is kata down from. It means coming down from out of their heart. What, what draws them, this lust in their own heart, their, their selfishness. According to their own lusts, they have heaped up or gathered or accumulated teachers to tell them what they want to hear. And I want you to notice something really, really important here. We shake yourself a second. Stay with me now. Notice that folks who do not want to hear the pure teaching of the word of God, they accumulate teachers. See the plural? They want the teachers to tell them what they want to hear. And they turn their ears away from the teacher, singular. The word truth here in this passage speaks of Christ. So look what happens. When you do not want to walk in the Bible, you don't want to hear the word being preached. You want to, and, and, and sadly, many so-called Christians fit in this category. We accumulate, we're, we're prone, and I say we because I'm speaking very generally, we, we will, are, are tempted to accumulate teachers, plural, that will tell us what we want to hear, and we turn our ears away from the teacher, singular, Jesus Christ, the Logos, who will tell us what we need to hear. Please let that sink in a minute. I am so thankful for all of the, the, the preaching podcasts that we, and even on the radio that we can listen to today. And they're good ones. Adrian Rogers, Chuck Swindoll, Charles Stanley, and, and others. But I'm telling you, with all of that good comes a lot of preaching out of these, out of ministries, out of churches, that are in the emergent church movement that tell you what you want to hear and make you feel good. And, and of course, obviously, you're going to think of Osteen when you, when you think of this. And, and, and that's why he can gather a large crowd, because he's going to tell people what they want to hear. And they're okay with his wife speaking, because she would be another one of those teachers that they accumulate I want you to know, if you listen to them, then you're turning your ears away from the teacher that one will tell you what we need to hear. But I want you to see something else here. They willfully turn away from the truth. And what do they turn to? Notice the word here. They turn themselves, their ears away from the truth, and they are turned aside to fables, to lies, to fiction. Now, I want to ask you a question for a moment. What, what are some of the fables? What are some of the lies that people are turning themselves aside to? Let me give you a few right quick. Number one is this prosperity gospel. It's this health and wealth gospel that supposedly is the automatic divine right of a born-again believer the moment that he is born again, and if he has enough faith, 
because of the atonement of Christ and the misapplication of Isaiah 53 by his stripes, we are healed. That has no bearing on physical healing. That has everything to do with spiritual sin sickness and that his cross work cures us of our sinfulness. But here the prosperity gospel says that once you're saved, you should also be able to not have your sin removed, but there goes all of your sickness, your poverty. And, and in essence, it's like, so I guess we'll never die. Well, what makes the prosperity gospel a false gospel? Well, Jesus' atonement, in their mind, extends to the sin of material poverty. Uh, they even bring in the Abrahamic covenant as a means to material entitlement. In other words, prosperity gospel says, now that I'm saved, I'm entitled to health and wealth. And that if you have enough faith and you give enough money, then you'll gain some more material compensation from God. And faith is a self-generated spiritual force that if you, you just send $95 to so-and-so or you give a certain amount, then you will be prosperous. And prayer is the means to force God to make you prosperous. Friends, that's blasphemous. And that's why TBN and some of these other channels, which quite frankly, I kind of think it's interesting we're not seeing too many faith healers in, in 2020. Where did they all go? But nevertheless, some of the other myths, and I won't spend as much time on this, but uh, there is that teaching that uh, you can speak in tongues if you are truly saved. If you speak in tongues, you're more spiritual. Or that your happiness is the most important. Or I deserve something. Or as I remember hearing uh, when we were ministering down at the melting pot, the, the, the teaching there that we're, that we're all God's children. No, we're not. We don't become that child of God. We're a creation of God, but we don't become the child of God until we come to Christ for salvation. And then there's the teaching that there's many ways to heaven. We're all going to get there. Uh, and as long as we're sincere, we're going to be okay. There are others that uh, there's uh, modalism, M-O-D-A-L-I-S-M. Uh, it's one of the most common uh, theological errors that's being taught today. Uh, it denies the Trinity. It, it says that God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're not three in one. They're stages of history. God the Father, Old Testament. Then at the incarnation, God the Son. And now, later on, the Holy Spirit, and uh, which is totally wrong. So uh, I, I, I spent a little more time there than needed, but nevertheless, exhortations for discipleship in these last days, preach the word. Preacher, preach the word. People, listen to the word. And then he comes back to verse five, preacher, persevere in the ministry of the word. Notice in verse five, but you be watchful, be sober. Be calm, preacher, in all things. Endure afflictions. And Paul, here he is in prison. He's near death. Can you just see the pathos in his heart and his mind as he's sharing with Timothy? Timothy, be ready. Be calm. It's going to be okay. You're going to endure hardship. I have. And if you want to read about it, go to 2 Corinthians 11 and see all that Paul went through. But he says, Timothy, Stay with it. Fulfill your ministry. Carry it out. Don't quit. Uh, one preacher, uh, Ray Pritchard writes, in a world of itching ears, preach the word. To a generation gone astray, preach the word. In a time of moral crisis, preach the word. When people don't want to hear, preach the word. When false teachers abound, preach the word. In good times and in bad times, preach the word the word. And when people listen and when they don't listen, preach the word. And I'll add one more. And in 2020, preach the word. In 2021, preach the word. So in view of the Bema, we must preach the word, 
But let me finish up the message by sharing with us, we must practice the word. Notice verse six, seven, and eight. These verses give us a past, present, and future look at Paul's life. And it speaks to us as well. We need to view our life in the present. Notice verse six. Think about today. But I am ready. I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. Today, believers, reproduce yourself in others. Notice the phrase, being poured out. Timothy, is it Paul were saying to Timothy? Timothy, preach the word, even in the face of opposition. I'm about ready to die, but I'm getting ready to hand the torch over to you. And I want you to know, one of the hardships of passing off the scene is, and I hear, I heard older guys uh, talk about this, and I even heard them say, oh, who's going to fill our shoes, and, and who's going to carry on the torch? Well, let me just tell you, God always has a remnant. God's, the church will not be defeated, and I, for one, am excited about young men like Pastor Andrew and Hunter and other men in our church, even younger guys and these younger fellows who, who I see potential in. They're going to be used of the Lord in days to come. We today as adults, we need to be pouring our lives into the younger. That's what Paul did with Timothy, what Paul did with others. And when you're gone, there should be others who will carry on with Christ because of your influence. It starts in your own home. It starts with your local church. And today, believer, reproduce yourself in others. Letter B, today, give yourself wholly to God. Notice in verse 6, being poured out as a drink offering, as a sacrifice, totally given over to God. And then letter C, today, view death as your blessed departure. Can you see, Paul? Can you hear him? And the time of my departure is at hand. Now, he didn't know exactly when he was going to die. He knew he was near death. He knew that Nero was breathing down his neck, so to speak. But you know, it's like the rapture. We, we talk about the Lord is at hand. He is saying here, time of my departure, to enter into the presence of God, it's at hand. And he viewed death as a blessed departure from this earth into the presence of the Lord. Because you remember what he said in Philippians 1? He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he knew what heaven held for him. And I want to say for all of us today, let's live in the light of the fact that as much as we are enjoying what we are around us, there's a better day coming. So today, we reproduce ourselves. Today, we give ourselves wholly to God. We view death as a blessed departure. But let's also, from this passage, view our life in the past. Notice Paul says here in verse 7, he said, this is how I'm seeing things right now. But I want to look to the past for a moment. I've lived as a good fighter. I have fought the good fight. Can you say that you're currently involved in the struggle for the cause of Jesus Christ, the good fight? I'm going to just mention this, how sad it is when I see a lot of fightings among believers, when I see fighting among families. I see conflict among people. It's not a good fight. I'm going to tell you what a good fight is. The good fight is for the cause of Christ. It's a fight that we are more than conquerors through him. And Paul said, I have lived and I have fought the good fight. I have fought in the arena of the cause of Christ. And then he says, I have lived as a good runner. I ran the marathon. I didn't quit. I stayed in my lane. But he says, I've also lived as a good soldier. I kept the faith. I've guarded that deposit of truth about Christ that was given to me. Believers, can you look back over your life and say, 
I've lived as a good runner. I've lived as a good soldier. I fought the good fight. But then he says, view your life, Timothy, and to us. View your life in the future. Verse 8, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Notice, I'm looking forward to that reward, that crown. Second of all, I'm looking forward to standing before the righteous judge because I know he will judge fairly, righteously, correctly. And I'm looking forward to Christ's return. As you look to the future, can you say, I love the Lord's appearing. I'm looking forward to seeing him. Oh, my friend, this passage, yes, it speaks to us as preachers, but it also speaks to us as parishioners. And in view of the Bema, we must preach and practice the word. I want to encourage you today to think on some truths as we end up things today. I want you to stop what you're doing. Would you just gather your thoughts with me for a moment? When you look at this passage we've studied, it's, an, it's, it's like Paul is writing out the statement of his life. I, I have, I've run the race. I've finished the course. I, I've kept the faith. I, I've fought a good fight. I, I, I'm, I poured out my life. I've given my best, and I'm looking forward to Christ. Let me ask you, Christians, I want you right now to write down a brief statement of your life. Now, I'm serious when I say this. I'm asking you to, to do something more than just watch with me here. Either write it down or think. What would be your brief statement of life? In other words, what Paul says here, in verse 6, 7, and 8, looking at the present, looking at the past, looking at the future, what would, you, what would be your brief statement of your life, past, present, and future? How would it read? I'm going to give you a moment to, to, to think about it here. I want to finish up this way today. You might be writing right now and, or just formulating it in your mind. And if you want to use six, seven, and eight as kind of a guide, that's, that's great. I'll give you a few more seconds here to think it through. And you may want to think about this even more after we finish up today. I'm not asking us to write a mission statement. I, I'm asking you to write a brief statement of your life. In other words, your autobiography in about two or three sentences, just like Paul did here, verse six, seven, and eight. This is his autobiography. Because your whole life is going to be reviewed before Christ. No, it's not going to be put on a big screen for everybody to see, as some people said years ago, and as a scare tactic to get people to, to move and come forward. And I'm not knocking invitations or anything like that. I'm just giving an illustration. But your life's going to be reviewed. Christ already knows. But in essence, at the Bema, what's your autobiography? How would you write down your statement of life? I would encourage you today to share it with your family, with your spouse, with loved ones around you. To consider that in view of the Bema, we must preach and practice the word. It's not our portfolio that's going to hold any weight 
at the Bema. It's not what we've amassed in this life. It's only what's going to be done, what's done for Christ, for God's glory, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, what Paul says here, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand, and I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. And henceforth, or finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And can you hear him say, oh, and by the way, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Amen.